Okay, so it's my pleasure now to welcome everyone here for this first uh, ever uh, General Assembly of the Safe Seaweed Coalition annual meeting. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, it's uh, a bit uh, a, a lot of emotion because it's the first time we see uh, all these people for real in 3D and I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I have first and foremost to, uh, to acknowledge uh, it's a team uh, effort all of this and uh, I would like to thank the, the team who created that event, which is uh, Nicola, Azedin, Philippe, uh, Kevin, uh, the Secretariat, and all the steering committee. We had a nice steering committee yesterday, a lot of decisions that will be uh, announced today. First and foremost, um, so it's uh, yeah, with a lot of emotion and, and, and very grateful to be here and to launch uh, this first CV day. Um, very welcome all those who are online. Um, please stay tuned, it's going to be a great day with a lot of uh, a speaking slot. We are now in Lisbon, next to the UN Ocean Summit, um, and, and um, we have the COP27 to come. There's a lot of worrying uh, facts uh, and, and a lot of drama and fears, and we are feeding this next generation with drama and fears. I'd like to tell you a short story to start with, uh, just to bring some hopes into that, uh, and remind about the past. 125 years ago, in New York City, was organized the big city planning conference. What was it about? The biggest concern of this time. Horse manure, basically. The world was submerged by horse manure. And there was really no way of avoiding that, because uh, horses were used for everything, I mean, transporting everything. Uh, in the cities, the lights, the water, the, the, the food, uh, wood, and everything, okay? So it was a big, big problem. And at this time, there are clear articles saying that uh, the cities and London will be overwhelmed and drawn under meters of horse manures, uh, four or five meters, over the next 20 years. So we had to do something, a lot of accident, of course, a lot of disease, a lot of problems. That was a big deal, and, and so they gathered all the big people uh, in the world in one place to discuss about this for one week. After three days, the discussion stopped and they all went back home because there was not a single solution that was looked as possible. We cannot stop using horses. It was used for everything. So the world was doomed to die under horse shit. <laughs> okay, that was the situation in... 1898. Actually, it's a, it's a pity that they did not last the conference a bit further because there was a guy to talk on the fifth day. His name was John Ford. A couple of uh, years after that, in 1912, John Ford released the first T-Mobile, the first, t the first industrial car. 30 years after this conference, there was more cars in New York and London and Paris than there were horses. 50 years after this conference, Horses were a touristic attraction in these cities. And the very funny thing is that 60 years after this conference or so, we had to make, make up some chemical fertilizers because there was no manure left. So maybe in 50 years from now, we'll try to make up and, and, and find a way to produce carbon in order to feed our seaweed. <laughs> so, and we will be the first one to voice it. So that, that, once again, let's not think that everything is doomed and that there's no solution. The world is full of solutions. Most of them are overlooked and ignored. We are here as a new wave of pioneers to enable new solutions. Uh, I'd like to, uh, uh, in order to do that, we had to, I mean, the first action after we did the manifesto with the support of UN Global Compact and, 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 and Lloyd Rogitler Foundation was to bring together these stakeholders because this seaweed industry is not new. There's a, a, a wide range of pioneers who are working on this for 40 years or so, and there's a big pool of expertise in, in Asia. But even in our part of the world, there's a big pool of expertise, and they are unknown, they are not visible, we, they, 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 are not, they are not heard. And I think our big um, challenge is to make them heard. So um, in order to do that, we, bring to get, we decided to bring together all this community under one uh, uh, voice, under one uh, home. And because we know that this community was uh, not very uh, rich and so forth, that they cannot 
afford a, a big investment, we decided to make this community totally free. And to do that, we needed the support of a visionary organization that was able to support this first ever civic coalition. That visionary uh, organization that decided to support safety, and uh, we'll know more why, because safety is a non-competitive topic, because if you bring together people from a highly competitive landscape and, and, and you try to make them work together, that will not work. And also because the civil industry has to improve in terms of, not, not, not that it's safe, but in terms of safety procedure, safety regulation for the environment, for the product, and for the, uh, for the people. So this visionary uh, organization was Lloyd Register Foundation, who decided to grant the f and to fund uh, this first ever global coalition. So next, I would like to leave the floor to Tim Slingsby, um, who will uh, voice here what was the objective and what was the vision of this uh, of this uh, of this uh, Lloyd Register Foundation, who, who we all need to thank once again because they have been so instrumental into this. And if we are all together here, it's because of them. They are the funder, but they are, they are also the one who carried the vision. Um, and and uh, so, Tim, it's my pleasure to welcome you on stage. Um, thank you very much, Vincent. As usual, my job is to try and follow Vincent's amazing introduction and uh, hang on to his coattails. Um, so, as you've heard, I am uh, Tim Slingsby, and I'm Director of Skills and Education at Lloyd's Register Foundation. My job title no longer encompasses all that I do, but what you do need to know is that Lloyd's Register Foundation is an independent global charity based in the UK, and we carry out uh, research, education, and innovation to try and make the world a safer place. And we identified uh, back in 2019, which in many ways feels like 100 years ago, um, safety of food as one of the world's biggest safety challenges, particularly in the face of a growing population. And it's one of the, ones, one of the biggest safety challenges to which we can apply uh, the foundation's strengths and assets. Within our strategy, we have three main goals. And the first of these goals is to build and find the best evidence and insight to enable us to focus on the second goal, which is where we can make a distinctive contribution to a safety challenge. And then recognizing that we don't own these challenges, they're the world's challenges. Um, we know that we can't make a difference by ourselves, so our third goal is to build global coalitions that can really have that big impact. And as we can see by the people in the room today and the membership of the Safe Seaweed Coalition, I think more than anything what we've done um, in the last couple of years epitomizes those three goals. But we started back in 2019 with a, a process that we call a foresight review. And very simply put, what we do is identify a number of experts from around the world, particularly in this case in, in terms of food and food supply and food supply chains, food processing, and then the basic process is to lock them in a room for two days and to ask them what are the threats and opportunities to safety and what are the opportunities for education. And then after those two days, we say, right, now write everything down. And we turn that into a foresight review. And what came out of that particularly as an opportunity for us was safe food from the ocean and notably seaweed. Um, and as Vincent's already said, we recognize as part of that process of due diligence that outside of Asia, the industry is relatively fragmented. But we knew for, through our um, uh, experience that safety is a, cat uh, a catalytic um, a collaboration tool. And so we decided that we would try and set up a safe seaweed coalition. Um, and it was helped enormously by the manifesto that we wrote with the UN Global Compact and uh, their support for that was absolutely formidable. So I think what's important to say is that we never envisage the Safe Seaweed Coalition as being responsible for growing the market. That's going to happen anywhere. But what we wanted to do was make sure that it arrived safely with all of the regulations and standards that uh, a developed market should have, rather than trying to retrofit them once the market had arrived at its fullest potential. So we now have this coalition of stakeholders and through which we can build thought leadership, convening power, increase knowledge and expertise, and importantly influence policymakers and consumers and regulators. And we were delighted, absolutely and genuinely delighted to partner with Philippe Botan and his team at SBR uh, and supported in setting up this endeavor by CNRS, of course, and importantly by the UN Global Compact as well. And we're absolutely delighted and proud to be a founding partner the Safe Seaweed Coalition. Uh, and with that, 
without any spoilers whatsoever, I'm going to hand you over to Nicola, who's been instrumental in your success so far, who's going to look back at some of that success. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. And uh, really, it's a pleasure to see all of you here today. And um, I am going to just share some, some of you have already heard this information, but it's, it bears repeating. We have been doing a lot. Um, I have to find the right button, there we go. We ha we've been doing a tremendous amount since the launch in March of 2021 of the coalition. We've especially focused on the UN Food System Summit and on COP. So we were at COP last year, and we plan to have a presence at COP again this year in Sharm el Sheikh. But that's not all. As you can see, we've been involved in many conferences, and we've been passing messages on behalf of the seaweed stakeholders who make up this coalition. So uh, we, we participated in the One Ocean Summit in Brest, enjoying very high-level support from France, and that high-level support continues. Monaco Ocean Week was very important. It featured many seaweed stakeholders and helped to showcase the multiple dimensions and facets of seaweed. At the Lloyd's Register Foundation's Safer World Conference, seaweed was on the main stage with Vincent doing a presentation. And also we had a very well-received exhibit. We're very proud of that, where we were able to showcase the offerings of many of our seaweed stakeholders and to be able to show the different, the different sides of seaweed. And from, from basic science all the way to fascinating end uses, including high-end design, including innovative materials. And also we did an online streamed event, Seaweed in 3D, where we talked about the three Ds that ended up being many more than, than three of seaweed, its distinctness, its diversity, its desirability, and many other Ds besides, including deliciousness, which was one that was suggested. And then we've been involved in a couple of other conferences. We were in Maine for the Northeast Aquaculture Conference earlier this year. We have also, besides conferences, besides preparing for this one, uh, FAO is an important member of our steering committee, and through FAO we've been supporting the update of the Codex Alimentarius, a very important part of harmonizing the global standards on seaweed. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're actively engaged in several partnership conversations as well, including very importantly, and you will hear later during, uh, during Seaweed Day in the afternoon, you will be hearing from the Aquatic Blue Food Coalition, which is a follow-up coalition that was set up further to the UN Food Systems Summit. We're a very active partner in that, and they're very active, <coughs> excuse me, very actively supporting us as well. Fine, oh, one conference I forgot to mention, very important. Uh, the UN Conference on Trade and Development held its fourth Oceans Forum in preparation to this event. And we delivered a few messages on behalf of seaweed stakeholders there. And those messages, messages the principal ones were countries, we encourage you to incorporate seaweed into your national planning, into your national action plans, into your nationally determined contributions, into your overall national development planning. Very important, and, and whether it's at the national, subnational, even local levels. And that's part of our helping to push for global harmonization of standards. So lots and lots of work trying to get on the policy stage and influence the policy conversations. In addition, in our communication, some of you may already be aware, some of you might actually be part of this innovative program, the Seaweed Ambassadors Program, which is a way for us to get out the message to people beyond direct seaweed stakeholders. These are people who are passionate about seaweed and who want to communicate about it in lay terms. In addition to the information that you see on here, we are developing what we hope to be a very interesting cadre of seaweed ambassadors who are open water swimmers. Open water swimmers who have achieved amazing things. For instance, who have swum the English Channel, who have swum the Catalina Channel, who have swum around the island of Manhattan for reasons that would escape me, because they do that in the summer. 
anyway, they do it, they get something called the Triple Crown. They have a very special relationship with the ocean and a very special relationship with seaweed. They're very passionate about it, so they're part of this program. And an important part of what we do, as many of you know, is we run these calls for proposals. Thanks to the financing that we receive from Lloyd's Register Foundation, we are able to provide grants of up to 50,000 euros through a competitive process. Last year, we did our first call for proposals, and we allocated to some 16 projects about 50,000 euros each, and, and for a total of about, uh, remind me, I should know this, but it was 400,000? Seven, thank you. Philippe is going to speak next. And f so we have just done another call for proposals. And this time we're doing two calls in uh, the year 2022. So this is why the number 400,000 is sticking in my head, because our steering committee met yesterday. And our steering committee decided on a number of projects to finance. And those projects, we are going to be announcing those to you here today. Philippe is going to come up and he is going to share with you what those projects are. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Nicola. And of course, uh, I will not uh, make the suspense too long uh, to, to, to deliver the list of uh, granted projects. But uh, first, I, I would like to, to thank uh, uh, several people, especially uh, Kevin Casella, our project manager, who was uh, very instrumental for managing the, the call for proposal, of course, uh, during the first year, but uh, this year also. We had uh, to manage first uh, the, the contracting of the previous project, and at the same time, of course, uh, selecting the, for, for, for new, uh, new series of, of projects. So that was a very hard work for during the last four months. And uh, it ended uh, yesterday evening when we, we, we decided, decided with the steering committee to, uh, to, um, to select for seven projects for the first call of this year. We will have a second call. And uh, to be completely transparent, we, will, uh, we may add uh, one or two projects to this list uh, uh, after some um, negotiation, but uh, at least I am uh, very proud to, to really um, uh, release uh, the results of uh, the active work of um, our steering uh, advisory board, which was, uh, in fact, uh, we had uh, very hard work during the last uh, two months to uh, evaluate uh, the project, uh, 57 projects which were uh, um, uh, submitted for the, this call, and to, um, to rank the, the, the project with uh, criteria which were based of, on the uh, strict selections. So the, um, the, the first um, uh, project uh, I will mention is uh, located in uh, Oceania, in New Caledonia. It will be based uh, there, even if it is managed by um, uh, Lydian Mathieu from uh, uh, the Blue Seaweed Company, which is located also in France. And uh, we will, uh, in fact, uh, create uh, a working group for the South Pacific uh, seaweed, um, and uh, especially addressing some safety issues and propose, com propose common standards for, for, for developing the seaweed industry uh, in, in Oceania. Uh, the second project is uh, located in Madagascar, and uh, is, it is managed by the Society of, uh, for, for um, the Fisheries at Sainte Marie in Nosy Bay, in the northeast of uh, Madagascar. And it will uh, deal with ocean data to accelerate the development of a uh, sustainable uh, seaweed industry, especially for, uh, to grow tropical uh, seaweeds, which are exposed to many threats, as I will detail later. Uh, the third project is uh, located in Tunisia, again in Africa. So enhancing to Tunisian capacity for seaweed production and biotechnology, and uh, it will uh, uh, be uh, managed by the National Institute for Marine Sciences and Technologies. The fourth project selected uh, is a safe post harvest handling resources for the kelp industry located in the United States. It is operated by the Green Wave organization, uh, which uh, is a very active uh, uh, organization uh, in the States to develop um, the skills for, for especially newcomers in the seaweed industry. The fifth project is um, uh, the Safe Seaweed Relief, um, which is uh, prototyping a typhoon resistant a platform for, for restoring uh, biomass when it, it is destroyed by, 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 by typhoon. So it's a very important project run by Cost for Sea Limited company. 
which is uh, um, based in uh, Australia, but we will operate in the Philippines because the, the mo most uh, exposed, of course, civil cultivation are located in, in the Philippines and in other places so in Southeast Asia. So uh, the sixth project uh, selected is um, a project from the LCC Wheat Company, which is a Tanzanian company, um, which is which relate, in fact, on the safe seaweed uh, development for for Tunisia uh, for Tanzania, and especially for about uh, nutrition for nutritional value and the risk uh, exposure uh, in the consumption of uh, seaweeds uh, for of or seaweed foods in Tanzania. And the seventh project selected is uh, from, uh, again from the uh, United States, and it is uh, really uh, related to a very important issues in uh, consumer, uh, um, consumer safety, which it is related to uh, the heavy metal and nutritional contents in cultivated kelps across uh, latitudinal gradient uh, uh, in, the, in the state, involving uh, many, many farmers, as you will see. It is operated by Ocean Approved uh, uh, Limited Company. So I will just uh, say a few words of, uh, about uh, each project. Um, and then you have uh, all the details about uh, the, um, the, the coordination of the, the project by the, the, the company and by the, also the, the coordinators. And uh, this uh, project in uh, Oceania, so it will be, be operating uh, all uh, across uh, the, Pacific, the South Pacific uh, uh, Ocean, uh, will uh, deal with um, constituting a, a working group uh, addressing the safety issues uh, and the lack of standards which are specific for the development of the civil industry within these regions. There is a uh, many uh, uh, important objective uh, for, for this project and especially of course re reviewing uh, existing regulation which can be ap applied to the, the development in, in, the, in this region but also uh, identify the gaps in the regulations assess uh, the risk uh, which could be associated with seaweed consumption uh, across the, this uh, region, which could be related to the possible, possible contaminants in seaweeds, uh, uh, some uh, contents of um, uh, elements which could be also make some concern for uh, human health. Uh, it could be also related to some toxins which could be present at the surface of seaweeds, um, uh, considering, for example, ciguatera. And then uh, they will produce a recommendation and they will really uh, launch uh, um, a very cooperative work uh, in this region which is not yet existing and uh, they will uh, disseminate uh, the, the results of, this, uh, the, of the project uh, all across uh, this region, uh, of course in interaction with uh, other um, ocean regions. The second project uh, located in Madagascar is uh, run by uh, Sébastien Jean, uh, who is uh, really developing new activities in uh, the northeast uh, uh, of uh, Madagascar, where uh, the seaweed uh, cultivation was, uh, was developed in the past, but uh, has collapsed due to some uh, very uh, important uh, major diseases. There were outbreaks of uh, ice ice and uh, epiphytism in this region. Uh, uh, several, so two decades ago, and then uh, the, 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 the culture was stopped. And so it is, this is why it is so important to, do, to redevelop uh, the cultivation by developing and exploiting new technologies which will allow to, uh, to, 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 to get uh, data uh, from the environment, um, to, 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 to store and to use this data to prevent the risk and mitigate uh, the, the, the potential exposure of the, the seaweeds to uh, different traits and especially uh, diseases. So um, this uh, project uh, is really uh, important for the, for the future of the seaweed industry. Of course, in, in that case, it will apply to the cultivation of tropical seaweeds, but it, it, it is important also for uh, other areas. And uh, we hope that uh, the tools which will come from uh, the this, this project will be would, could be applied in uh, in other uh, regions too. Uh, the third project located in Tunisia is also very important because uh, Tunisia is really a, a very active uh, country in Africa, developing the seaweed industry, both the developing uh, seaweed cultivation, but also uh, seaweed processing, especially uh, for the, um, all the testering, testering agents, uh, agars and carrageenans. And uh, this project is run by the um, uh, academics and uh, by uh, National Institute for, for, for uh, Marine Sciences and Technology. And uh, it will uh, develop a strong capa uh, capacity building for the seaweed cultivation in Tunisia uh, in order to really develop the sectors. And they will consider both the cultivation and the, the, the production technology 
uh, thanks to the, 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 the presence of, uh, of uh, an existing industry in Tunisia. So they will uh, really establish um, a very important network for North Africa for strengthening a, a long-term research on uh, innovation uh, in, uh, the, in, in, in this sector. Then Green Wave uh, is still uh, very active uh, to uh, con continue the, the investments in the uh, United States to develop uh, uh, the, the potential of, uh, of seaweed production, and especially uh, in this project, they will focus uh, on the, uh, the post-harvest uh, technology, which are so important for handling seaweeds uh, when you, are, uh, you have to keep uh, freshness or to, 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 to preserve uh, the, the the, the biomass after, after harvesting uh, in a few hours, uh, sometimes after harvesting, especially for kelps. And uh, they will work uh, with uh, the many industry uh, stakeholders also, uh, which are involved in the, in the marketing of, uh, of seaweeds to develop uh, uh, safe uh, practices. And they will, of course, uh, di disseminate uh, these resources uh, as it, is, it was done uh, in the past by, ocean, uh, by Green Wave, and especially uh, within the, the ocean farming hub and uh, training will be organized uh, to, to promote all the, these activities. So uh, for Coast for Sea, uh, the, um, for the, 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 this project located in the Philippines, uh, it's really a, a tricky uh, aspect of the, the, the development of uh, tropical seaweed uh, cultivation, which could be exposed uh, to many risks, uh, especially uh, uh, climate risk, and, uh, uh, and in that case uh, is the, the increase in the intensity or the frequencies of, uh, of typhoons, which could destroy uh, uh, very large uh, areas of cultivation, and of course, uh, um, uh, threaten the, 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 the availability of, uh, of, uh, of other seedlings for, 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 for the farmer to restart uh, the, the activity after, after the typhoon. And so that uh, is an important point for, for, for the seaweed industry because if we can prevent the too much transportation of, uh, of uh, seaweed seedlings uh, across different regions, that would be very important for biosecurity. So this is why we have to encourage the development of uh, regional hatcheries on, uh, which will keep uh, some very important uh, crops for, for, for the local uh, uh, farmers and, uh, and accelerate, in fact, the biomass recovery after some uh, uh, climatic e events. So this, this project is really um, uh, well targeted. Of course, there is other issues which could be related to typhoons and which will uh, involve many projects in the, in the future. So the, the project on the, for LC seaweeds located in Tanzania uh, is really um, a new development for, for Tanzania. Tanzania has developed a seaweed industry based on, on, the, 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 on the exportation of, uh, of, of uh, tropical red seaweeds, especially uh, the, uh, the, um, the spinosum uh, cultivation, which of course was successful for, for several decades, but uh, which uh, started to, to become less uh, profitable due to some uh, threats on the, on, on the culture and, and to uh, some uh, diseases which uh, d reduce it a lot, uh, the, 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 produc the production in this area. And so the local uh, farmers and uh, the local organization uh, group together to uh, investigate the potential of, uh, of course, m maintaining the, the, the activity of, uh, of um, uh, spinosum cultivation, but also diversifying uh, the cultivation of uh, cot cotony, but also other local species, which could be of uh, very interesting nutritional, va nutritional value for the local communities, and, uh, which could provide, of course, from food for, 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 for humans, but also uh, other products when, when, when they are processed. So it's really a very important step in the development of, uh, of, of, uh, uh, of the civil industry in, uh, in Tanzania, which will uh, be very instrumental to also uh, um, direct some uh, development in other um, uh, African countries or, or tropical countries uh, for providing uh, f uh, food for humans uh, as it is stressed by FAO. For the ocean approved uh, project, uh, so the, um, it is a very important topic uh, and it is uh, related to uh, a previous project, which is uh, uh, the, p the potential contaminants uh, in, in, in the seaweed biomass which is produced by cultivation, or which or, 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 but so related to, to, to the harvesting of, uh, of seaweed. And, um, and this, uh, Beautiful project will involve 27 farms uh, over uh, a latitudinal gradient from Alaska to uh, uh, 
uh, Maine and uh, or, or, uh, and Connecticut in in, um, in in the states and on the west coast also, and that will provide a, a very important databases on uh, the content of heavy metals and also nutrition nutritional value of uh, of, of kelps uh, within these gradients. So this uh, uh, project will. Uh, be very important also to um, to address the variability uh, uh, of uh, and to understand better what are the drivers of uh, the, this, this um, of the content of uh, heavy metals and other contaminants in in uh, in seaweeds and how we can also improve uh, some cultivation practices to to, to 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 deal with that. So I will uh, stop here uh, for the, the announcing the the, the the seven projects and I hope that, that in the near future we will. Uh, be able to announce on our social media maybe uh, at least one, uh, one uh, additional project. And of course, I will encourage all our members to uh, think about uh, our second call for proposal for the, this year, which will be launched uh, probably by September or early October uh, next fall, and uh, which will be open and we will allow us to probably select again between seven and nine uh, additional projects for funding. So thank you very much for your attention. So now we are, we are welcoming uh, Sander van der Broek uh, from uh, the project uh, coordinator of uh, the Seaweed by Design, uh, Safe Seaweed by Design uh, project. So thank you. Thanks for that introduction, Philippe. Indeed, my name is Sander van der Burg. I coordinate the Safe Seaweed by Design project, which should be on the next slide, there it is, Safe Seaweed by Design, uh, a project that is funded by Los Vegeta Foundation and a child project to the Safe Seaweed Coalition. Uh, it started one and a half year ago, so I'm going to try to summarize 18 months of work in 10 minutes. I'm not going to uh, succeed in that, so do ask me questions afterwards if, if you have any. The project uh, is coordinated by Wageningen Research, but I should give credit to our uh, consortium partners, Solent University in Southampton, China Ocean University, and Arctic Seaweed in Norway. They run a seaweed farm where we uh, did uh, test our protocols for safe seaweed production. Because that's what the project is about. It's about, uh, in a nutshell, it's about developing protocols that can support the developing emerging seaweed sector uh, dealing with safety. Uh, this is very small. <laughs> so uh, uh, we aim to help the sector in monitoring and assessing safety. Uh, there is a, oh that's also very small. There's a pilot to uh, we have a, a pilot included in this uh, in this project to test our protocols to test our proposed um, methods for sampling and for uh, analysis, um, and we explicitly aim to collaborate with this sector to make sure that what we develop uh, in the safety of our uh, offices is also useful for the sector and uh, and works in practice. So that's uh, pretty much the project in a nutshell and. Um, after the introduction of uh, Fissan, and I think after the projects that, that Philippe showed, it might not be necessary to spend too much time on this slide. Safety is an issue for the seaweed sector. Uh, we ran a survey last year, and one of the respondents took the time to write, write a lengthy reply uh, explaining that we shouldn't focus on safety. We shouldn't be too concerned about the negative things. Indeed, we should emphasize all the positive things of seaweed. So when I talk about safety of seaweed, this is not to say that I do not see the positive things of seaweed. But I do think that safety is important, and we should be aware of this. Because um, food safety does limit the uptake of seaweed in, in certain markets. Uh, it, it is a problem that seaweed farmers have to deal with uh, when they want to get rid of the seaweed. Um, and believe it or not, there is also concern about the uh, f plans to upscale seaweed production globally. There is concern about nutrient depletion and the effect that it will have on the ecosystem. So if we do not deal with these concerns, it might bounce back uh, and, and uh, be, have a very negative impact on the sector. Well, lastly, safety of workers, probably no need to explain that, but accidents happen not only in uh, uh, low-income countries, accidents also have happened in the Netherlands with seaweed farmers that sadly passed away. So this is, these are concerns, uh, and we should address them. Well, measuring safety, that was the title of my, <laughs> that, the title that Nicola gave me. Uh, it's not that easy to measure safety. Uh, there's not one metric to say this is safe or this is not safe. The people on this photo, they are enjoying the water uh, waves, but if you look at it from a different perspective, there's a giant white shark there. This also goes for, for safety when it comes to seaweed. So the safety, you cannot measure it in one metric. It's dependent on the conditions. There's, this is why we have purchased on site selection. 
It depends on the species that you farm, on how you pr produce your seaweeds, when you harvest them, how you process them, uh, for what markets you use them, uh, how much seaweed you consume. Uh, if you talk about food safety, it does make a difference if you eat a few grams of seaweed or hundreds of grams of seaweed a day, uh, and many more factors. So this is not what we're aiming to do. One metric for safety, indeed, instead, um, we aim to write a generic protocol that helps the future seaweed farmer or user to understand which hazards are relevant and understand uh, why they are relevant and uh, support them in, in, in selecting a method for assessing those hazards. Uh, but in the end, uh, a, a full risk assessment is dependent on the local situation. It needs to be tailored to the situation where that farmer uh, works. Now we try this in one case, so that's our pilot. This is a case where we have a specific protocol, we have specifically described how we measure a range of issues. It's the Arctic seaweed site, and these experiences will be very useful for the other sector, but you cannot use them for the other companies in the sector, but you cannot use them as a blueprint. So it's for inspiration only. Well, what did we do? So we, uh, we did explore quite a number of uh, hazards in that, uh, that site, so uh, we, uh, on, uh, not on this f slide, but on the previous slide, you did see the sensors, so we did explore the use of sensors real-life monitoring of uh, met ocean conditions, how does that help seaweed farmer dealing with safety. We have ROV images of this uh, of the seafloor underneath the seaweed farm done before and after harvest to see if there's any impact, positive or negative, on the, uh, the seafloor. Uh, we have nutrient samples, uh, we did light measurements, uh, and we have a range of uh, uh, food safety analysis where we look not only at heavy metals but also at allergens and other uh, contaminants. Um, some uh, advertisement for publication. So this is first work that was <laughs> already published uh, in the journal of Foods. Um, so have a look if you want to know more. And uh, as said, it's only a few minutes, so um, there's much more to tell, but let me know, uh, reach out, and I will uh, be happy to tell you more about the project. Thank you, Sandra. I learned a lot. That was great. Thank you very much. So I'm going to speak to you briefly about some exciting developments in the coalition before turning over to Eric from uh, UNGC. One of the really exciting developments for us is that since the launch of the Safe Seaweed Coalition, it has been foreseen. So it's housed right now in the CNRS, the French National Research Center. We're looking forward to shifting to being housed in the United Nations Global Compact. And this is really important for us. We've seen the importance of this right now in this conference, the kind of access that we are able to get to policymaking fora by having that UN brand, by being part of this global organization that is UNGC. And you'll hear more of what UNGC is thinking about from Eric. <clears throat> But, um, but what's really interesting for us is that over the course of this coming year, we're gradually going to effect that transition. <clears throat> so we think it's really going to enhance our strategic ability to reach policymakers uh, through access. For instance, getting into this conference, it made a difference to us to be able to go through UNGC. We wouldn't have been able to, several of us, including yours truly, wouldn't have been able to be accredited to the conference without UNGC. So we're really grateful to you. Thank you very much, Eric, and the entire UNGC team, because the other thing that I want to mention here is that behind the scenes, there's been some incredible logistical support to help us to get ready, including these beautiful badges that I hope you keep forever. For those in the room, I hope you keep these forever up on your walls in your sets of uh, conference badges. Uh, so, other than that, we thought it was important also to just give you an idea. We've been talking a little bit about money. What does it take to deliver that funding, which is about two-thirds of, of our overall budget, but behind the scenes, there's some important stuff that goes on. And we, we pretty much came in where we had planned, there's, you know, small variance, roughly. So about 900,000 is, is what we've actually spent in the last year compared to a planned budget of 920,000. We have a slight increase planned for next year, 
But as we do go through the, the process of shifting to UNGC, that might change because we're seeing some of the personnel changes, some of the, the pinch points, some of the bottlenecks. And as we go through this shift, we might be thinking through some of that. So we may need to readjust the budget. But this is what we have right now. And let me just give you a little more detail because it's important that you know behind the scenes, there are important people like our coalition manager, Kevin, like our communications ma manager, Azadine, their salaries are on this budget and that we wouldn't be able to do what we do without them, wouldn't be able to have these calls for proposals delivered, wouldn't be able to have all of the social media and other messaging happening without that. So, just wanted to let you know that. And um, in addition, very importantly, there are a couple of pillars, and our steering committee yesterday discussed how might we take further strategic advantage of those pillars. So do be expecting some more messaging on our pillars. But right now, um, Sintef, you're going to hear from, for those of you staying for um, <coughs> Seaweed Day in the afternoon, Jorun from Sintef is going to be a panelist. And, um, and Liz from SAMS is also, we hope, going to be a panelist. She's had to um, drop out because of illness, so if she's able to speak, she will. And if not, then we, uh, we will have, we'll feature her in other events going forward. <coughs> Excuse me. And with this, let me turn over to Eric on UNGC's priorities and how you see the Safe Seaweed Coalition fitting into them. Thank you. And then I will be back afterwards. Again, I'm getting in my steps today and my stairs. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Really exciting being here. I want to share a short story with you. My wife, I'm, I live in Oslo. I used to live in New York. Pandemic came, moved to Oslo. Uh, and my wife uh, and I, we live there, and she's an architect. And she... Part of our project portfolio is uh, refurbishing big office buildings. And she had this project only a few months ago, uh, downtown Oslo, a building from 1932. And they were uh, taking out uh, the floors. And insulation in cold Norway is a big thing for us, you know. We, we really uh, take that very seriously, insulation. And this is from 1932. And that all the insulation in that building was seaweed. And it was even the sheet from the producer in 1932, Oslo Seaweed Company, that had produced all this seaweed to insulate the whole office building. So there are some competencies that might have been lost on the way. And let's hope that we find back to some of those uh, multi-use uh, uh, for, for seaweed. So, uh, and, and thanks for this great partnership. This has been a fantastic journey. We couldn't dream about this. So the UN Global Compact, it's a private sector arm of the UN. Founded by Kofi Annan back in 2000, he said you need to call for the private sector and the NGO community to come together so that we can deliver on the world we want. And with the Paris Agreement and the 17 SDGs, we have a very clear direction. We have a very strong mandate. And at the UN Global Compact, we have the 10 principles covering all the essential UN conventions that we try to get uh, the companies and the civil society to commit to. Covering climate, environment, human rights, labor rights, and good governance. As well as delivering on all the 17 SDGs. And I'm heading the ocean work at the UN Global Compact. It's part of the portfolio of work streams we have at the UNGC. We work with shipping, offshore renewables, aquaculture of um, salmon, seaweed, of course. Uh, we work on end waste entering the ocean, ocean data. And no other project ticks all the boxes in the UN. It's amazing. Seaweed is the place to go. It's climate, it's environment, it's a very, very social inclusive industry. It's uh, labor challenges, but lots of labor opportunities. And as we've seen here now, good governance, very transparent. Very, very happy to see that we are very open about the numbers and that we can create good standards and good safety standards for this industry. We can actually set these standards before this industry takes uh, the next step to the next level. And I met uh, Van So uh, at the first UN Ocean Conference back in 2017 and met him a couple of times since. I immediately understood the potential of this very nascent industry. Uh, and as we're taking these next steps, I would like to say that 
This is not only about the UNGC. This is all the way to the top. Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the, uh, of the UN, he's our chairman. And he's very demanding these days. We need climate action. We need environmental action. We need human rights actions. And you know, even he is now aware of the potential of seaweed as part of this instrumental part of this solution. So I'm very glad to say that we are not alone in the UN uh, uh, building to really be the strong advocates of seaweed. We have a whole team from IMO to FAO, IOC, UNESCO, and so forth. It's a big family waiting to grow this industry together with you. With, I think we already now have 750 entities as part of this seaweed coalition. That's the strongest thing we've ever done at the UN Global Compact. They're all over the world, and they're from small companies to big ones like uh, DNV, Sintef, and LR, uh, but also small-scale uh, farmers and producers and consumer brands. It's fantastic, and um, I'm so proud to be part of this journey, and you have very strong ambassadors in yourself and, of course, in the team. So next year, as was said, uh, we are very happy to really bring it to the next level. It really deserves that. And it, we are doing this together with CNRS and LRF and all the other partners that are currently working on this. But we are now putting this on the top of the agenda in the UN to really explore the full potential of this fantastic, we don't, shouldn't call it weed, it's, a, it's, a, it's the sea forest, you know? It's a fantastic opportunity. So thank you so much for collaborating with us. Um, we will build a strong team, even stronger than the one we have now, with the other UN agencies, with other organizations, and we want the mainstream capital to identify and understand how they can be part of this journey. So it shouldn't be only, the grants are very necessary to kickstart this, but we want the mainstream capital to understand the carbon, the food, the feed, the medicine, the fuel that can be part of this journey. So again, thank you so much for bringing us into this and being part of this journey. Thank you so much. So me again, um, but this time this is about you because we asked for your input, your feedback, and you responded, some of you. Uh, we, we got feedback from 58 people. Now, as you just heard, Eric talked about some 750 members of the coalition. So we will encourage you, actually, to go, um, let me just check whether I'm, I'm saying something that I should or not. Can we maybe keep that survey alive? We can. So Azadine has just confirmed to me that we can keep the survey alive. So we would encourage you to go in and respond. Here's what we have so far, though. <clears throat> Excuse me. So really grateful to those of you who took the time for your thoughtful input. Greatly appreciated. Some demographics for you. So um, we can see that the profile is roughly that the respondents are relatively younger. That is the, right around here, if you, you see that more people around the early 30s ages, and more men than women, although I'm not sure that that actually reflects the overall seaweed population. So women out there, maybe you might want to respond. About one third are self-identified smallholders. <clears throat> And um, the top responding locations, which may have something to do it, are Europe and the Americas. So we know that we have stakeholders around the world. You may, not have, you may not have seen it. You may not have had a chance to answer it. Please do. We are very interested in your responses. So in addition, <clears throat> we have, so this is still in terms of the demographics. Whoops, pressed on the wrong thing. So we've got, different value chain actors in here. We've got, we've got the producers, we've got the processors, we've got the retailers, and we have some in some, some more niche types of occupations. And when I say niche, it's niche because of the numbers who were responding. We'd love to see the profile overall in our membership. But it's broad representation across the value chain. We're very happy to see that. And um, we did see that um, the person, so on the how did you hear about the Safe Seaweed Coalition, you see that the dominant response is that you heard about it from somebody. 
So remember that uh, comment about the seaweed ambassadors and their important role? You're all seaweed ambassadors. Please do spread the word about the Safe Seaweed Coalition, that it is member driven, that there's no cost to join, that the only cost to you is that you will be getting lots of information about seaweed and that you will be, re you will be able to have your voice amplified. So in terms of costs, I don't know, I think that's not a bad cost. Next. Um, <clears throat> how could we better interact with you? Okay, you want it all. That, that's the, the basic message here. And the most that you really want is real life events and meetings. There's that hunger for real life events and meetings. In terms of the kinds of topics you would like us to tackle. We talked about this in the steering committee meeting as well. How would you like our calls to be structured? To be, what would you like them to be focused on? And maybe those topics might be tackled in other ways as well. But as you can see, the top topics are the safety topics, food and consumer safety, environmental safety, and occupational safety. Well, actually, occupational safety didn't, didn't make it up there so much, but certification, and if you put traceability somewhere in there as well, there's, there's lots of energy around that. So we take note of the interest there. And then in terms of where you want us to devote our efforts, the lion's share, basically you want us to continue working on helping to improve the harmonization of standards, on advancing knowledge, and supporting the industry. So that's what we're doing, and we're happy to keep doing that. And we had some great write-in suggestions as well. We want to be able to take a little bit more time to look at those in detail. And actually, as more of you respond to that, that will be valuable. Please do give us some write-in suggestions there. <clears throat> some more... Um, some more demographics, actually. What are our stakeholder categories? Well, most of you, in terms of respondents, most of you are academic or research and industry small scale. So I'm going to go over this quickly. We've got two slides, lots of different kinds of stakeholders. Since we're going to be sharing these slides with you afterwards, please um, feel free to have a look at that and see what kinds of stakeholders there are. And now it is time for a Q&A. And um, Philippe is part of that Q&A as is a certain Mr. Dumezel, who I do not see in the room. Um, so Philippe, perhaps you can be taking questions first of all, while one of us goes and finds Vincent. <laughs> so please go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, is there any questions in the room? Uh, also, I don't know if we can take a, no, we can, we cannot take. We can. We can, okay. Because they'll be monitored online as I'm Okay, perfect. So there is a microphone in the room, so you can, everybody please. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, I just wondered if both of you might say a few words about um, the, 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 the membership of the Safe Seaweed Coalition, both in terms of how it met or didn't meet or surpassed expectations and how that membership might be mobilized um, in of itself to advance some of the aims of the coalition. We go, uh, we go for that one if you agree. So there's not so many uh, questions Philippe cannot answer, especially when it comes to seaweed. So uh, on that one, I feel confident uh, speaking in front of him. <laughs> um, well, I think, I think we somehow surpassed what we expected. I think there was a great, great uh, mobilization when we launched the coalition. Um, I think, I think no, the, the trick for, I mean, I think we mobilized a lot of people in the Western world. Uh, which is good. Uh, we are still to mobilize uh, much more people in the, in, in the Asia world where we have to overcome some uh, language difficulties, obviously. Um, and it's a very, uh, very established industry there in Asia. 
Uh, so uh, we need uh, some support in, in, in building. Of course, we, we supported. I mean, in the first batch, there was a lot of projects in Asia supported and funded. Uh, so we have we have good connection, and we have uh, we have representatives from China and Korea and and Japan in our uh, steering committee. Uh, but still, I would say, the, compared to the, the the state of the industry there in Asia, I think we have to uh, we have to get more members. And I think the the next challenge will really be to uh, to uh, to take to get lessons from from them and understand how, how they went so far in terms of seaweed uh, cultivation and so forth. So that's one of the objective. The objective also for next year, uh, to me, and that's where uh, our partnership with UN Global Compact will help a lot, is to better manage this community, create some, uh, some more discussions in there, uh, trying to answer more questions, provide more uh, input to our members. Because uh, so far we've been very busy building this coalition, very busy granting, uh, I mean awarding grants, um, we, we may do much more when it comes to m moderating and mobilizing the community. We had one person to deal with that part-time, so that was uh, very complex. We launched this Ubuntu platform, which has an objective to really create a home and a, and a portal for this community. But I think we still have improvements to be made uh, in terms of uh, mo mobilizing and managing this community online. So that's our objective, and I think once again the partnership and with the UN, I mean the hosting by UNGC and the and the, the fact that um, we will uh, benefit from their experience in that will uh, will be of great help. Yeah, just to complement, uh, and uh, as we will see that uh, this afternoon, we are, we are also aiming to to co to cooperate with many other organizations, especially with the coalition, which may be located in some continents and uh, we will uh, have uh, some hubs which will uh, in fact relay our actions and that will also increase uh, the potential to, 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 to make the, the, the coalition known for potential members so that uh, of, of, in fact in, in the context of the COVID-19 uh, during the last uh, two years it was sometimes difficult to to, to, to understand uh, um, and to sort between all the, the, the solicitation, uh, especially uh, with the, so many web webinars which were organized and to, to, to really, not, and now we are much more entering in, in very concrete actions and that will uh, promote, in fact, uh, the activities of the, of the coalition and make uh, it much more uh, knowledgeable for, 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 for many people. Um, thank you very much for organizing the Safe Seaweed Coalition. My name is Matilda uh, from Ocean Purpose Project. I come from Singapore uh, in Southeast Asia, and I also uh, work with 115 traditional fish farmers in the north of Singapore. We are testing and growing things such as um, uh, Alva Lactuca, Eukema species, as well as Gracilaria. Um, you know, our fishermen don't speak English, and some of them don't know, don't know email, only maybe WhatsApp. Um, you know, so the community work that we do has to be really in person and in field. But the other thing that Ocean Purpose Project does is we're trying to be online. We have a lot of social media and community work that we're doing. The struggle for us is actually um, because we are an NGO and because we are small and without resources, we don't really know um, how to leverage off global knowledge bases around specific seaweeds um, cultivation, how to grow the knowledge base, seaweed for bioremediation or seaweed for food production, or even how to improve our safety or labor standards. I mean, it's a total zero at, the, at this juncture. However, we have a lot of interest from Malaysia, from Philippines, from Thailand. Maybe could you each give me one or two suggestions of how Safe Seaweed Coalition would be able to help a small little NGO uh, in Southeast Asia like ourselves um, and also some potential uh, uh, benefits that this could bring to any of the people in the room who are investors or, or government agencies as well. Thank you. I think that that's exactly what I meant in terms of our effort to Asia. Uh, not to disclose anything that is not yet totally secured, but uh, we may have a partnership with EDF to start very soon on mobilizing small holders. Uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, notably uh, creating some hubs there to mobilize them to have a fully dedicated resource to do that and to support these resources uh, regionally. As mentioned by Philippe, we need to have hubs. I mean, Southeast Asia is maybe was the biggest or the second biggest region when it comes to seaweed. I mean, Indonesia is 30% of the production. Uh, there's a, a great, great potential uh, 
it's 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 amazing but uh, indonesia uh, on uh, on itself uh, in itself is 70% of the tropical sea in the world <laughs> so the tropical coast so uh, 70% so it's, it's quite massive in terms of uh, the type of seaweed we can get from there from tropical seaweed so um, so yeah that's a region of high interest we need to partner more i mean there are some discussion with the jeff as well uh, with some uh, w w wwf uh, project running on in this running uh, in, on in this region as well once again, th th that's always the same question. We are only four, and we have been overwhelmed by uh, by solicitations and by uh, and by trying to voice what we we were we are willing to do. So now, I think, as mentioned by Philippe, we are trying to get a, a second stage. We will need to leverage. We need to find new funding to to get new 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 funders, uh, and uh, and we will need to expand it and 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 rely on regional hubs. So the, the community is still there. I mean, there's a lot of things uh, you can get out of the coalition. We have in our advisory board some uh, some of the best uh, scientists uh, of the, um, um, scientific sorry, uh, in uh, in the world with Alan and others on, on red uh, seaweed, red tropical seaweed. So uh, always happy to raise questions there and and, and create. We had uh, a lot of work around this uh, tropical red seaweed, but uh, but yeah, that's something we have to improve. Maybe Philippe, you want to complement it. Um. Just, just a few words. Uh, I think we are, we are, as it was announced by, by, by Nicola, we are starting really to increase our interaction with uh, the Blue Food Coalition. And I think in this context, your activities are, are very important with uh, the local smallholders. And, uh, and that will help, uh, especially to integrate much more seaweeds in the, in the cultivation which, uh, of other um, uh, aquatic species which is existing in, in your countries in Southeast Asia. That, um, that will provide, of course, opportunity, as you were mentioning, for bioremediation, but also for providing uh, additional food. And uh, so we are working on, on that. We, and we, we, we had many discussions with uh, important uh, scientists within the, 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 the blue food assessment. And, 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 uh, and that uh, will be important. And, and uh, so and as you are also organized on, on a, as an NGO, I think it's easy for, for you to, to, to become an intermediate for, for your local uh, uh, communities, uh, even if they are not uh, uh, English-speaking uh, people. They, uh, you, you could be really the relay for the contact uh, with the, the Safe Civic Coalition, of course, uh, as a, being a member, but also applying with them uh, for uh, our call for proposal, because we are really searching for uh, see, uh, providing seeding money to very uh, local uh, initiatives and not only big projects. Uh, and uh, so if we can be supportive for, for the future, future, yeah, we will um, uh, do our best. And uh, as we were also discussing yesterday with our steering committee, we will also help uh, the, 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 the people to apply to uh, our call for proposal. So uh, because we're, sometimes when you are not an academic, you are not familiar to for, for with a uh, with, um, uh, form for, for an application for, for, for funding. And so that's, uh, that is important also if we want to reach the, the right people and uh, to help really the, the right communities, we have to uh, help also the people to apply to our uh, uh, grants. And one short note on this one, because there's a story I love about Southeast Asia and, and how seaweed contributed to uh, restore peace in Philippines. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, back some years ago when uh, the Muslim from the South decided to uh, agree on a peace agreement uh, with the Philippine governments, the Filipino government was a bit worried because uh, there was like 40,000 40, weapons uh, circulating in a, in a population that was, uh, that was uh, unemployed and that was living out of war for the last uh, 40 years. So they were, I mean, they were like, okay, we have, uh, we have, uh, uh, everything is destroyed. We have 90% uh, unemployment and a lot of weapons circulating. So that's not a good uh, signal for future peace, you know, and, uh, and, and it, it was a ceasefire. So they cannot really collect the weapons. So they organized with the CIA, in fact, uh, in the US, uh, a massive uh, trade. And they were selling uh, seaweed for guns. That was a seaweed for guns campaign. So they were exchanging. Uh, uh, some seaweeds against uh, the, the, the guns uh, from the from the rebel from the rebel. So each rebels, uh, each former rebels, because they are no, we are coming with guns and and they were getting some seaweeds and some training, short training about how to grow seaweeds, 
And now, uh, today, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the chief of the rebel at this time uh, has become the seaweed king because he's the most uh, <laughs> powerful uh, guy in the region uh, for seaweed. So uh, once again, it has really uh, enabled uh, the government of Philippines to collect a lot of weapons from these rebels uh, and, and, and develop an industry. And, uh, and there's also a story because some of them had to uh, escape to, uh, to Malaysia and they are now what is called the sea gypsies and they are growing seaweeds on their boat. So there's a lot of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of stories in that region, and, and I think seaweed has, a great, has played a great role already, but there's a great role to play for seaweed there. Yeah. I love stories, so I cannot stop sharing them. <laughs> yep. uh, Me again, uh, I think this is a super important uh, part of uh, the next step on the journey, and uh, at the UN Global Compact, we have uh, 16,000 companies and 4,000 civil society organizations organized with us through 71 local networks, one of them being in Singapore. And of course, these local networks are not seaweed experts, but they are great conveners of businesses, finance, human rights experts, labor rights experts, anti-corruption experts, and so forth. And we try to strengthen the supply chains on all kinds of uh, industries. And and the seaweed is the rising seaweed is the rising star. And, and I think complementing with your own new network and the other partners that we're discussing here today, we can really grow a strong global community, breaking the language barriers, very important to us. And as some of you maybe have heard on the conference so far the last few days, it's also very important for us to bring CVID to COP27, uh, to the Biodiversity Conference and all the other main UN meetings. And we work with UNEP, we work with UNFCCC on these issues and they want all of you aboard. And they don't want only Vincent to speak, you know, they want the community to speak out, to be more ambassadors on this issue. So that's uh, really welcoming and really looking forward to strengthen the work uh, of this uh, fantastic team with our local network, uh, network's capacities to bring even more people together. So thank you for that. Okay. We have been very clear. For me. Okay. So well, uh, when, I mean everything was uh, was very clear. I think if there's no question, so I don't have much to say. Uh, I think the next uh, the next thing will be to try to eat seaweed uh, and understand how it's delicious. Uh, I, I mean, there's one question that was not raised, maybe because you are all specialists, but it's like, ah, oh, yeah, but seaweed is not good, and how can we uh, convert people into eating them? I think it's just like raw potato. If you eat them raw, it's no good. Uh, if you try to cook them and, and, uh, and learn how to cook them, that's, that's delicious. So I think that's the same with seaweed. So we have to, uh, we have to learn, and I think that part of the uh, experience here will be to try seaweed. Uh, today we have uh, we had uh, we had some seaweed burgers on uh, with seaweed buns and they will be seaweed buns here today. So that's part of the theory of change as well to uh, to uh, to get familiar with this new type of food all together because once again that can only be all together. We have a, a, a very demanding world to feed in the next 50 years or so. We will have to produce as much food as we ever produced over the last 10,000 years. That's kind of a challenge, um, and, and we won't make it only on land. We will need to do it on, on, uh, in the ocean, and, and seaweed is, uh, if you want to restore, to f if you want to feed the world and, and restore uh, ocean instead of destroying them, I think seaweed is really the best place to start. But we have to be all together once again, which is the ultimate objective of this coalition. I think the, 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 now we have some, uh, some, uh, sh some time for uh, sharing and, and, and uh, exchanging, which is the most important. After two years of Zoom conference, we all look forward to speak together and, uh, and get to know each other and see how tall and how, how small we are in reality. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I'd like once again to thank a lot uh, Nicola uh, for organizing this because she has been working, uh, uh, burning the midnight oil for the... Uh, the, uh, for the last uh, couple of days, uh, same with uh, Kevin and, and, and Azedin, um, while, while, while we were lazing on the beach with Jason Momoa and Antonio Guterres. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, thank you very much for, uh, for everything. Thank you very much for, to UNGC Portugal and to Altis for uh, accommodating this. Annabella, your, 
did a great job. <laughs> uh, and uh, which is another uh, example of how the, the use of local network can be very beneficial for, for this very new and young and, uh, coalition. We need, we need some more support. Nicolas, the floor is yours. And I, 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 I see you at two, I mean, on the next time. Uh, I see you at two. I, I, I am back at two here. We are back at. We're back at one thirty. So this this is why I wanted to do these announcements. <laughs> <laughs> so so first, thank you very much, Vincent. This is it is now indeed time for those of us who are here to enjoy the lovely, delicious food that has been prepared, including I do want to give a shout out to our friends at Sea and Flower who have provided this seaweed bread. So please see the two people who are waving in the back of the room. Thank you so much for that. Um, for those online, sorry, but do look for Sea and Flower online and do, do encourage your own, um, your own food providers, food purveyors, to think about ways to incorporate seaweed into their cooking. So now this is the logistical and administrative stuff. For those of you online, please join us for Seaweed Day, which begins at 1.30 Lisbon time. That is GMT plus how many? Somebody who knows this better than plus one. So GMT plus one, please join, join us online. If you don't know where the link is, register through Eventbrite. If you have not already, do that and you should receive a link. Or, and or, please go to the Safe Seaweed Coalition's website. And it is showing there, thanks to the incredible work of Azadine, making sure that we are available to you all. And, um, other than that, I would like to add my voice in thanks to the UNGC team once again because you have just been tremendously helpful, wonderful. We couldn't have done this without you. We also could not have done this uh, done without the technical team here at Altice. So a huge thank you to the technical team here who's sitting in the back and looking like they're there, there, there we go. I was going to say, and looking like they're, they're not doing anything, but they're really, really doing a lot. We couldn't have done this event without them. And thank you very much to Altice for making these fabulous facilities available to us. We're also very pleased that our caterer has worked with us to prepare some delicious, healthy offerings. So please do enjoy the food, and we look forward to seeing you again at 1.30 GMT plus one. Thank you very much. Just adding for the room, there's also an exhibition from Runare who is a designer working with seaweed just uh, at, the, at the outside of the room. So you can see, uh, she's just arrived and Nicola was not aware. You can see what we, ca we can do so many different things with seaweed.